Okay, so I am ready to go for tonight's stream. The problem, the problem is I don't know where the remote for the TV is. And I can't turn it off. And it's making me very, very frustrated. <laughs> uh, well, Pumpkin Bear, get get excited even more because it's like one of the primary topics of this week's, uh, the video that we're shooting while we're down there. <laughs> um, let's see. I just gotta find the TV remote. There it is. <laughs> it was hiding. It was hidden away. It was hidden away. No, 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 no. God forbid there be buttons on the TV, right? God forbid we go back to the way it used to be where you could just walk over to the TV and hit a few buttons to get what you needed. No, no, none of that. None of that, kids. These days, these days you need a remote for everything. For literally fucking everything. It's it's actually, it's actually incredible. I'm gonna try and adjust this camera maybe some. Uh, see, now I'm like... Nah, nah. I feel like I'm too far to the one side. It, it, it's whatever. Anyway, uh, yeah, the video we're going to be shooting while we're down in New Orleans is going to cover uh, the Axeman, uh, the um, Jacques de Saint-Germain, um, and what was the last one? If I have time to get to it, uh, the Storyville Slayer. So those are going to be the three main topics. Is this higher than usual? I, I don't know. Something is weird about my desk today. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, those are going to be the three main topics. Uh, we're also going to be diving into some of the mystery regarding the Natchez people, uh, a, a Native American nation from the, uh, from the Mississippi Valley. If I could just get this angling right. Yeah, Native American nation from the, the Mississippi Valley who uh, are, are oddly, oddly distinct from all of the other ones. Um... Although this may be a case, as I'm looking more and more into it, this may be a case of the Natchez being um, part of a group and there just not being enough enough to it, uh, enough, enough research done. So it may just be that we need to do more research on the topic, uh, not just me, but as, as a field, as historians, than has been done. Uh, we have pretty expansive dictionaries uh and we know a good amount about the vocabulary and the gram the grammatical structure of these these groups these people these these native americans but we don't have a an answer yet some of the issues are that well yeah the the vocabulary matches but the grim the grammatical structure doesn't the syntax does not uh, in other cases, it's that the syntax matches, but the grammar doesn't. So the question is, what happened? <laughs> um, you know, how did how did we get to this point where this language is apparently not connected to any of the others? There's also the fact that Nachez, uh is basically... How do I put this? Um, the area of the United States where the, the Nachez language existed also contains four, four other language isolates. It is very valid to ask the question, how on earth do you fit five completely isolated languages that are not connected to each other, nor to those surrounding them? How do you have five of those? in a land area smaller than that of the country of Greece? That's kind of the question I have, and it might be one of those things where it's like, ah, well, we're not going to get an answer to that, you know, within within my lifetime, let alone within the week it takes me to research for a video. Especially since I basically only had today to research it, and I did not finish it, so I'm going to be doing a lot of it on the plane tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, so the, the, the Nichez stuff's very interesting. I've seen a number of theories uh, going so far as to suggest that they are uh, Mayans, or even Aztecs. Uh, the thing is, they're a little. It's. I, I'm coming. I'm coming to a hypothesis as I do more and more of these videos, and I don't think that uh, that they're going to have been a waste of time because what I'm coming to understand, and and to wonder myself is, are we seriously underestimating what has been known as the Mississippian culture? This is the. It's also known as the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. 
but there's all of these mound building nations and tribes that spoke uh, primarily Suin, Catoan, and Muscogean languages. All of these groups, we've sort of believed, had a general shared maybe religion, but that they weren't part of the same nation. I, I'm wondering more and more, were they in fact related? Like, were, were these different languages that were all part of the same empire? Was the Mississippian culture actually an organized, structured nation-state in and of itself that maybe started on one part of the Mississippi and expanded its way outward and had essentially a golden age, something akin to the Roman Empire uh, or the Persian Empire or Alexander's Empire, and we happen to get over here at the tail end of it. That's what I'm starting to wonder. Uh, obviously, you know, I am not a, I am not an anthropologist. I'm not a historian of the of the Native American peoples. Um, but I think that that's uh, that's all very relevant information. I think it's all worth looking into, uh, asking questions about. And, you know, that's, at the end of the day, I think that's what we need to make history back into, was people asking questions and then going and researching to find out if it was right. We've become so concerned, so uh, sterile as a field regarding not rocking the boat, um, you know, constructing a simple, easy to understand, easy to teach narrative. And I think that in some ways, uh, progressivism in academia, in the academic sense, has led to us failing to ask the right questions because we're afraid of offending people. To say, oh, well, maybe when we got here, the, the Muscogee were in a dark age, and that's why they, they had so few people, why they were so uh, disparate, why they were so easy for Americans to overthrow... It starts, you have people who start to claim that that's racist, or that that's insulting, or that's infantilizing, and in my opinion, it's precisely the opposite. I'm asking the question, why is it that when Europeans got here, Native Americans were building, you know, were essentially still, in, a, in many cases, semi-nomadic? Why were they building structures that were single-story? Uh, you know, all of these questions that we have, when we know that the, the Mesoamericans, for example, were building using stone... A thousand years before we got here and we also know that the mississippians were building these complex cities full of mounds and that they had trade networks spanning essentially the entire continent i think there's a serious disconnect here between the mississippian culture and what we ran into when we arrived in north america and i think that asking the question of what happened is not is not you know racist i don't think that's inappropriate to wonder so what I'm hoping to do as I as I compile more and more information about these groups is start to form those connections. All right, well, what does this look like? Who who do these people seem like they might have connections with that we just don't have it anymore? Because if you look at these groups, uh, the Muscogee, for example, stem from the Mississippian culture. Their language is one of the primary language families of the world so far as we know. Um, the, it, it appears to not be a descendant of any sort of, uh, language that, that we would recognize in the Americas. So it's not, it, the way that things currently look with linguistics, it appears that, for example, Algonquin and Iroquois are not from the same language family. By the same token, Iroquois and Muscogee are not from the same language family. There is a proto-Iroquois, there is a proto-Algonquin, there is a proto-Muscogean. Um, so you see these sort of like weird divisions that when you look at Europe and you look at Africa and you look at the Middle East and Asia, the way the Native American distinctions work doesn't fit with the way we see everything else. Usually, like taking Indo-European, which is I know I know Indo-European better than I know uh, Afro-Asiatic and those those other language groups, but Indo-European originates with the Yamnaya culture. The Yamnaya culture comes into North America or not North America. The Yamnaya culture spreads west and south out of the Caucasus and into Europe and the Middle East. And what do we get? 
Well, we end up in a situation where Sanskrit, Persian, uh, the, the Balkan languages, Celtic, Germanic, Nordic, these languages, despite the fact that they're not mutually intelligible, we can trace them all back, for the most part, to a set of shared common sounds. And we can hypothesize, we can theorize that these languages were descendant from one language spoken, or at least one language family, spoken by this migrating corded ware culture. So, if that's the case over there, and what we saw was that they migrated into Europe, and seemed to have completely eradicated, for the most part, the pre-Indo-European languages. By the, by the Roman period, Essentially, nobody is speaking a non-Indo-European language. The, the Etruscans are gone. The Basques are relegated to a very small region. Uh, we don't know what, what the language of the pre-Celtic inhabitants of Britain and Ireland sounded like, so it's impossible to guess there. Point is, when the, European, when the Indo-Europeans came into Europe, Indo-European became the only language family that mattered. It was the only big one. And yet, when we look over at the Native American tribes, we find that they do not seem to have the same situation. This is an entire continent with not one, but multiple language families. And they're not connected to each other either. We're not looking at uh, Algonquin being uh, easily, obviously descended from Athabascan or Dene, uh, Dene. The two languages have certain things in common, and the, the cultures certainly have mythology in common, but they speak two completely distinct languages. Language families. And then you get the same for the Uto-Aztecan, and for the Muscogean, and the Iroquois. Uh, all of these different languages all over the Americas that all descend from completely isolated groups. And how the hell did that happen? is a huge question that I cannot for the life of me understand why it is not a bigger issue in history. You know, we're sitting around and we've got all these people who are talking about Tartaria or Atlantis or Mew or Lemuria, and don't get me wrong, I find Atlantis to be a fascinating subject, but we have another more solvable mystery right in front of us, and one that, if we were to solve it, might actually give us answers about some of these other big things. If we're wondering about the possibility of uh, you know, ancient, really ancient lost civilizations, are we maybe screwing up by not investigating these these weird differences in how the Americas function? But, you know, anyway, that's that's my, my 10, 12-minute monologue to get the episode started. We're going to start this one off with a channel that I have historically been very, very, uh... Well, let's just say I don't, I don't love these guys, but I know they're popular. So we're going to look at BuzzFeed Unsolved, because they, uh, they have a video with 20 million views on the Axeman of New Orleans. So what I want to know is, do they say anything really stupid that I should just avoid this week? <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I, how I see all of that. So I hope, I hope that wasn't too, like, in the weeds for anyone. But um, yeah, so that's what I've been super, super, super interested in. Uh, all day is where the hell did these people come from? So I'm going to really quickly close a door, uh, and then I will be back. Uh, actually, I'm also going to get myself some water. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right, so let's see what Unsolved came up with. I will be I will be forthright. The only thing I know about this case so far is that he primarily targeted Italians. Uh, by the way, the reason we have Columbus Day is because the largest mass lynching in U.S. history uh, was actually like 11 Italian guys, and it almost led to war with Italy. <laughs> so. Oh, and where's my, uh, my audio? This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we cover the Axeman Killer of New Orleans, one of the strangest serial killer cases I've ever read. And you've read a lot. Yeah, I read a lot in my time. And, You're a uh, sicko. I still can't I'm not hear a them. Sicko, I'm interested. Oh, there they are. Okay, maybe I'm a little weird, but this guy had a flair for the dramatic. I think you're gonna enjoy it. Okay, all right. Let's get into it. 
Starting in 1918, over a period of roughly 18 months, the city of New Orleans and surrounding areas were rocked by a serial killer that would later go by the name, The Axeman. Also, I, th I think this might be part of why I don't like BuzzFeed, and specifically BuzzFeed Unsolved, is that, like, 2010s content creator voice they do, you know? Um, I feel like when I talk to the camera, I talk in much the same way that I talk to normal people. Uh, there's usually an upward inflection at the end of the sentence, to some extent. Um, but for the most part, I feel like I talk to the camera the same way I would talk to another human being. For whatever reason, during the 2010s, there was this... They did the same thing with the, the upward inflection at the end of the sentence. But instead of it being like that, it was like that. I was researching about New Orleans. Like, it just, I don't know. I, I just, I'm not a fan of that. I, there was a recent, it wasn't super recent. It was like a year ago, but there was a, a TikTok. Here, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can find it really quick. Could you tell that I barely took my meds today? Um, TikTok about crumble cookies. Uh versus other cookies i can't i can't remember um what was the uh, was it insomnia it wasn't i can't for the life of me remember but it was this one tiktok um let's see if i can uh oh there it is crumble cookies versus last crumbs lemon cookie crumble very refreshing and tastes like the Starbucks lemon loaf. Last you, you see what I mean? You, you see what I mean? No hate to this this content creator, this girl. I'm sure she's I'm sure she's very nice. But I just don't like it's the it's the the inflection. Listen to it. Crumble cookies versus last crumbs lemon cookie. Crumble. Very S Somebody in the comments section, you can't see it, but over on the side of the screen, somebody goes, "Why do you talk in top 10 scary horror stories?" <laughs> like refreshing and tastes like the Starbucks lemon loaf. Last crumb. Moist and the powdered sugar on top is a great addition. Also, I like that there's no artificial flavor. Close, but crumble wins this one because I love this icing. Crumble cookies versus last crumbs lemon cookie. Crumble. Yeah, so basically every single comment is something along the lines of uh, she talks like them old news reporters, Burger King foot lettuce. I, uh, so yeah, but this, this like, I, I, did Buzzfeed create this? Was this Buzzfeed's version of like news anchor inflection? Oh, chills. That's who that. Oh my God. For, for anybody who hasn't seen chills, that's precisely Number 15, Pennsylvania sighting. After hearing a disturbance on the edge of their wooded property, a farmer in Carbondale, Pennsylvania, went to check it out. Like that. I can't stand it. Ah. The Axe Man was the manifestation of the Boogeyman, lurking in the shadow. That's a good way of putting it, Alfarius. It feels like Tom DeLonge speaking instead of singing. Don't waste your time on me. You're already the voice inside my head. Shadows of New Orleans, almost exclusively <laughs> attacking at night, and is possibly responsible for 12 attacks and six killings. In killing we're, we're also going to up the speed, because, like, a lot of YouTubers talk way too slow, and I think they do it because if they talk at normal pace, then they're going to end up not being able to monetize the video because it's going to be too short. Uh, I mean, think about it. Our videos are about an hour to an hour and a half long, typically, and I speak like this. Imagine if I talked like these guys. In fashion, he only seemed to strike people while they slept in their beds. I love this right off the bat. What do you love about it? Well, I love, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I love it when serial killers have a fun little thing. I don't approve of serial killers, but I think if you're going to kill a bunch of people, you might as well have some fun with it. I feel like you have baseball cards with this guy. You, I absolutely do not. They don't this is very similar to how Aiden and I sound when we're talking privately. They don't make serial killer baseball cards, though, do they? If they did, you probably own them. You, bro, they should make serial killer baseball cards. Would own them. No, I think you'd own them too. I'd, I'd be own like, them. I'll trade you a Gacy for a. 
<laughs> I trade you a Gacy for a Zodiac. So Tafka Day, uh, yeah, I, I would see where you're coming from. It's just the video came out way before AI got, got capable of doing that. Also, terrifying watching how fast AI is improving. We should shut that down. It should be gone, drop it, bombed. No. <laughs> so we need to we need to stop playing with fire. We barely survived having nukes. <laughs> the Axeman eerily never used his own tools. He only used what he could find on hand in the victim's households, usually an axe, which he typically left behind at the scene of the crime. Everybody had an axe back in the day, huh? Yeah, you know, my biggest takeaway from this case is why not just throw your, your axe, axe away? away? Yeah, it's literally the first thing I would do. But these people were like, Arr, leave the axe oh, in the he shed. doesn't take my axe. <laughs> I've got my porch axe, my shed axe, my kitchen axe. <laughs> <laughs> creepy tendencies now established let's get into the timeline uh also pumpkin bear said the dear women legend from the natives in louisiana did you happen to see my message on discord by chance i had not but i will take a look at it on may 23rd 1918 at 4901 magnolia street the first suspected axeman attack occurred catherine and joseph maggio were struck violently by an axe a straight razor used on their throats wait he hit them with the axe and then cut their throats I don't know. It also could have been his, since it was his first one, he was figuring out oh, if he was going to be, he like was like, okay, there they are. are. Yeah, uh, the razor remind boy. me to get back to you after I finish up shooting this video. Boy, Razor Boy would be a But, uh, let me just really quickly read it. Um, Saturday, I might be able to make work. Um, we get in, I get in tomorrow, Aiden gets in Thursday, but I believe we're doing dinner Thursday. So, we'll probably be out and about Saturday to film. Um, so that would be probably the best day to do it. Yeah. Be a good sidekick for him. Also, if anyone else is in New Orleans, we're going to be there, uh, Wednesday through, well, Wednesday evening through, uh, Sunday. Probably going to spend most of the time inside with Isaiah, but... Razor Boy's not... Axeman and Razor Boy? Axeman, I think, strikes a little bit more fear into my heart than Razor Boy. Lock your doors, Razor Boy's out tonight. <laughs> Catherine had been almost entirely decapitated, and Joseph had suffered many severe injuries. The bodies were discovered... Wait. Skynet came online in 2024 in the Terminator movies? It's been a long time since I've seen them. That's terrifying. By Joseph's brothers, who lived in the same house. Especially considering the movies deal with time travel. Like, <laughs> Nothing was heard or seen, and no valuables were taken. The bottom panel of the kitchen door was knocked out. All that was found was an axe. So he probably went back here through the back door. Yeah. That's usually how he did it. I assume the only people who saw him were the ones who were killed. Some of them survived. And do you think these guys told the people who lived in these houses that they were doing this? Or, or do you think they just kind of like pulled up to the houses with a camera crew and walked around? And they would just also, I gotta say, that house does not look like it was built in the early 1900s. Or like a large looming figure, like a dark figure. Oh. So he really did become kind of like a boogeyman. He kind of grew there, there are beads everywhere in this town. <laughs> but it means New Orleans. Fingerprinting was around at the time, but was allegedly not yet a standard procedure. A little over a month later, on June 28, 1918, near the corner of Dorjanois and La Harp Streets, another attack occurred. A severely injured Louis Bessemer and Anna Lowe were discovered by a baker named John Zanka making- Give me one I want to look something up. Yeah. So, this was probably part of the lead-up to that. Making morning deliveries. That's sad for a baker. They actually thought he did it. They thought the baker did it? Well, I mean, like, anybody naturally. That's why, if I ever found a dead body, I don't know if I'd call it in, man. Thoughts on First Kings 1 through 4. Let you me, wouldn't uh, call it in. Take I'd call look. it in anonymously. I would not want any part of it, because that's the first person they look but at. But in today's surveillance state, you would be suspect number one, because they'd be like, what? Why'd you call it in anonymously? Well, then maybe I'll just spend my whole life trying to avoid dead bodies. How about that? Also, this you guy didn't know. He was just delivering bread. He opened yeah, He was door. probably like, good morning, I've got you, Ben. Oh, my God. <laughs> Lewis would actually survive the attack, and Anna would survive for another seven weeks before dying. Anna supposedly recounted to the police that a large white man with a hatchet had attacked them. The bottom panel of their bedroom door was missing, and once again, a bloody axe was left at the scene. Another beautiful street, though. It is a beautiful street. The trees in this area are just so nice. Sometimes even the most beautiful places hold the darkest secrets. Uh, oh, wait, why is it showing me in the New International? I want the American. Uh, the reign of Solomon, when King David was old and advanced in years, though they covered him with blankets he could not get warm. His servants therefore said to him, let a young virgin be sought to attend my lord the king and to nurse him. 
if she sleeps with you, my lord the king will be warm. So they brought, uh, so they sought for a beautiful girl throughout the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite. So they brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful indeed, and she nursed the king and took care of him. But the king did not have relations with her. So it's been a long time since I've read through First Kings, but the way that I would read that is in the context of uh, Mosaic Mosaic Jewish law, which would have been the law of the time, uh, because we're, we're not through to Solomon's legal codes yet. So by this token, what you'd be looking at here is that I, uh, and, and let's pull it up in, uh, let's pull it up actually in the Jewish, the Jewish Bible. Um, see uh oh god this is not properly this is not fully translated um is that this is weird actually if you look at it if you want to see what i'm looking at um it, al it almost looks like yiddish um like it's a weird a weird mix of english and not English. Uh, Hamelech clearly means king. Uh, Molach meaning ruler. So Melech would mean the king. Uh, when when King David was uh, sick and stricken, they covered him with something, but he could get no warmth. Uh, let there be sought for Adonai. Uh, for the okay. Let there be sought for the king, uh, a Nara Batula, and let her stand before. God, ah! Now I gotta go get the interlinear. I gotta get Strong's. Gotta get. Ugh. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Now I'm doing this. Now I'm doing this. Uh, is there still a way to watch your reactions to Mind Unveiled? Oh, yeah, I don't think they're saved anywhere. Uh, I can go back through and do another one, though. I have no problem being petty. Uh, da -da 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 -da. uh Judges, Kings. Kings. Also, keep in mind that David is not, uh, necessarily always a good character. That is a very important thing to keep in mind with the Bible. I think a lot of people read the Bible and they're like, oh, well, if King David or Solomon or Joshua or somebody did it, then it must be good. And it's like, mm, no, that's not the case. Um, both of those people were chastised numerous times. All right, what do we have? Uh, in the KJV, we get, now King David was old and stricken in years and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. Wherefore his servant said unto him, let there be sought for my king a young virgin and let her stand before the king and let her cherish him and let her lie in thy bosom that my lord the king may get heat so they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coasts of israel and found abishag uh, a, Shun a, a shunammite and brought her to the king and the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him but the king knew her not so what do we get uh all right so she became part of david's harem um, which tells us that David had a harem, which is obvious, but not necessarily a good thing. Uh, okay. We read through it a little bit. I mean, this is the ascension of Solomon, basically, so... Yeah, so I mean, what what I would say about this, what I would say about this is basically that David is known for being lustful, and he was chastised for it on numerous occasions. He was not supposed to take multiple wives, he was not supposed to have multiple wives, um, and just because his servants do something does not necessarily make that a good thing for them to do. So let me, for example, pull us into Samuel. 
Was it the reminder by Samuel? Nope, that's Saul. Here, let me uh pull it up. Uh okay. Uh King David and Bathsheba. That is 2 Samuel 11. Pull it up so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But we're not going to do the NIV because why on earth would we use the NIV? It's awful. Um, we'll use the... Uh, let's do the New American Standard. I like that one. Uh, okay. Where is the important one? Messenger departed. That's Uriah. Lord sent Nathan to David. Ah, here we go. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in a city, the one wealthy, the other poor. The wealthy man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing at all except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nurtured, and it grew up together with him and his children, and it would eat scraps from him and drink from his cup and lie in his lap and was like a daughter to him. Now a visitor came to the wealthy man, and he could not bring himself to take any animal from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. So he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this certainly deserves to die. So he must make restitution for the lamb four times over, since he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, You yourself are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. It is I who anointed you as king over Israel, and it is I who rescued you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and put your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord God by doing evil in his sight? You have struck and killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife as your wife, and you have slaughtered him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Uh, now then, the sword shall never leave your house, because you despise me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This is what the Lord says. Behold, I am going to raise up evil against you from your own household. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. Now keep in mind, at this point, it has already been made rather clear that marriage is supposed to be monogamous. You're supposed to have one man, one wife. David has gone outside of this. And because he is the king, it has been okay, basically. This has been determined not to be a grave enough sin, a not, not a big enough issue. It's basically, I don't think at this point it's been made uh, clear. That, that I don't think it's been written down that monogamy is the only thing you're allowed to do, essentially, is what I'm saying here. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, yeah, it's, it looks not great. But you got to remember that there's a whole entire context when you're dealing with the Bible. Um, ben, I'll, uh, I'll humor you one more time, but then I got to get back to the, uh, the subject. Proverbs 21, 19. Proverbs 21, 19. Uh, 21, 9, sorry. Um, it is better to live on a corner of a roof than in a shared house with a contentious woman. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is a funny one. It's entirely a funny, uh, Psalm or not Psalm Proverbs proverb. Honestly, I mean, the whole thing is, is statements like this. Basically it's. It, I mean, they're Proverbs. Um, so that one, I mean, basically it's saying it's better to, it's better to uh, live on the corner of your roof than to marry someone with whom you do not get along is probably the way to interpret that one. Um, but yeah, so getting back to the content at hand. Profound. Okay. Roughly a month later on August 5th, 1918. Also, the reason they would find a virgin for King David would be because... Otherwise, they'd be taking a married woman. Um, again, virginity and marriage are inextricably, inextricably tied in Judaism. In, in an undisclosed home location. Or at least I should say in uh, in second 
in first and second temple Judaism. Mrs. Ed Schneider was found by her husband in the afternoon at their home. Mrs. Schneider was still alive and rushed to Charity Hospital. <laughs> and would I do remember the, uh, the, the TikTok, uh, the council versus Shay and I was the scribe. Reportedly survived the attack. Upon investigation, it was discovered that their axe was missing from their shed. Mrs. Schneider was also pregnant, and I'm happy to report that in the week following the attack, she successfully gave birth. Good for her. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, that's that's a, something. That's a super mom right there. Is yeah. that the only axe baby out of this whole story? <laughs> I, th yeah, I think that's Can it. you imagine being an axe baby? I don't, I don't know if that's a thing. I'd go around telling everybody, one of one. My one mom one took a one of a kind baby, axe baby. My mom took some hard steel to the noggin. And then I popped out. Jesus. Five Actually later, impressive. On August 10th, 1918, reportedly near Tonti and Grafier Street, 80-year-old Joseph Romano was found by his nieces Pauline and Mary after they heard him struggling. I don't know if this even necessarily counts as a a serial killer. This is almost more like a a spree or a mass murderer. His head was bashed in. The two girls allegedly saw the attacker and described him as, quote, dark, tall, Heavy set, wearing a dark suit and a black slouch hat. End quote. Joseph Romano would die two days later. This guy sounds like the villain from Rocky and Bullwing. I will say these do almost sound like mob hits because what you're dealing with is somebody who uses items that are already in the home and is well dressed. That said, other people could be involved. Cool. Yeah, he does. What's this? It's odd that a a mafioso would be after Italians. Slouch hat. I think it's, um, I don't know. I was about to talk out of my ass there. Are you gonna Google that? I'm gonna look up a slouch hat, because that sounds like something I need. Right now we're at the side of the fourth attack. Is the yellow house? It may be. We just know it was on this corner. Honestly, this axe man might just, like, could be a fan of quaint houses. He's a fan of corners, too. Not that it's okay to kill anybody, but the elderly above all. Yeah. Well, at least he lived a full life, right? No. Oh. You're he right, missed... actually. Well, he didn't, I'm sure that's not how he wanted to go out when he was picturing retirement. Well, nobody does, getting... but with an axe. I rescind my statement. Maybe if you're if you're gonna be a serial killer. Maybe kill elderly people. Kill the elderly. That's a weird thing to advocate, but I mean but they've lived a long kind of vibing with Shane here. I don't I don't dislike Shane as much as I recall. Long life. That's true. Around this time, August 1918, the New Orleans State's newspaper allegedly recounted, quote, armed men are keeping watch over their sleeping families while the police are seeing to solve the mysteries of the axe attacks. Extra police are being put to work daily. End quote. And when looking at the timeline, it apparently worked. For a while, that is. As nearly seven months later, on March 10th, 1919, the Cordomiglia family was attacked. Rose Cordomiglia woke to her husband, Charles, fighting- I- mm, why is he saying Cordomiglia? It's Cordomiglia. 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 You're only gonna get that G- It's gonna be that really subtle Italian Cordomiglia. Migli. Gli. Sound. In the Axeman a fight that Charles would lose. Rose and their two-year-old daughter, Mary, were also attacked. Rose and Charles would actually survive, but their daughter tragically did not. In typical Axeman fashion, the axe used belonged to the Cordomiglias. Did they call it Axeman fever or Axemania? Or did they call him Axie? Or were they like, everybody in town's got Axeman fever as the terror continues to grip the community. This just in, throw away your axes. This just in, more skulls crushed. Whoa, <laughs> throw out your axes. <laughs> Five days later in New Orleans. Good Lord. Newspaper called the Times Picayune received a letter from the Super Chats? Tax Man. Uh, then, oh, sorry, I missed yours. Um, let me go back really quick. Uh, all right, Pumpkin Bear, what did you say? He said, "Learn how to pronounce the street name. Learn how we pronounce the street names. Shotgun houses are great. No Barataria reserve this trip. What are you looking forward to on the trip? Are are the street names not pronounced?" The way would I that I would anticipate them to be? I'm gonna grab a random street. I, I mean, I would assume that, like, that looks like Rampart. That looks like Basin. I, I, I believe this would be Shart. Burgundy. Like, yeah, is Ursuline? Am I getting these right? Perdido? Gravier? I would assume that they're pronounced the way they would be in English unless it's a French name, right? Probably. I mean, I could be wrong, but that that would be my assumption. Uh, 
And let me have my Barataria. Reserve. Ah, okay, it's a park. Yeah, no. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time to get out and about quite that much. Uh, honestly, what I'm looking forward to the most is the food. I am so, so, so excited for the food. Quote, hell, March 13th. Really? I am surprised at, at how not normal the pronunciations would be. I'll, I'll ask Isaiah if I'm, if I'm good. <laughs> Esteemed more Listen, Mustang Mom, I'm just jealous that you guys are getting snow. We got one little snowstorm over the weekend, and it ended up somehow getting warmer afterwards and then raining. They have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen my Hang on. Yoon receive. Oh, throw out your accents. <laughs> Five days later, a New Orleans newspaper called the Times Picayune received a letter from the apparent Axeman. Quote, hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether which surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a felt demon from hot as hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axeman. End quote. To be fair, that does kind of sound like a hoax, but we'll see. Kind of poet laureate. <laughs> no, this is incredible. Is this Robert Frost? <laughs> he also goes on to insult and threaten the police. Quote, they have been so utterly stupid so as to amuse not only me, but his satanic majesty. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am. For it were better that they never were born than for them to incur the wrath of the Axeman. End quote. This is very Old Testament. It's like most serial killers just like to stroke themselves, and this is just... He was right, and he was like, Ooh. the devil, his satanic majesty. That'll get him. Time to go murder again. I will. ...to remind the people that he could be worse. Quote, Undoubtedly, you Orlinians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death, end quote. Not to, not to discredit him, but he is killing people in their sleep with an axe. And what's his success rate? I gotta say, your striking power and aim isn't Johnny on the spot. Yeah, you should be batting a thousand at that <laughs> you point. You should be batting a thousand. However, the most important clause is a specific threat that would terrify the entire New Orleans community. Quote, now, to be exact, at 12.15 o'clock, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to the people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose house a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for the people. One this almost feels like somebody who makes jazz music trying to capitalize on a serial killer. ...thing is certain, and that is some of those persons who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Jazz it! <laughs> you better jazz it! It, I will say, it feels very Old Testament, very like Passover, you know? Like that, that is a New Orleans version of Passover right there. When you think about it. You know? Paint your doors with lamb's blood. Play jazz music in your home. It sounded ex I, I mean, here, I'm going to pull that up for you. Let me go into Exodus. Uh, play your insects. The Passover lamb. All right. Okay. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. I, I mean, this is just Exodus, Exodus twelve twenty three, but with jazz. I mean, like, I, I'm just kind of imagining, I'm just kind of imagining the angel of death going door to door and just hearing a little bit of...
and then being like, you know what? Nah, they're good. They're chill. They're cool. Uh, <laughs> literally, this guy's showing up at the door with an axe like, yo, like jazz. <laughs> Watch the video I just sent you on Discord. Uh, let me see. Ooh, okay. That Proverbs 31 woman is cute, but she ain't got nothing on me. This is Hey, convenient. I'm Callie, and I'm pronouncing words. We are pronouncing New Orleans street names. Uh, okay. All right, all right, all right. Here we go, here we go. Real quick, real quick, I'm going to try and guess. Ready? Calliope. You can't see it on your screen, but uh, it's... It's it, there. See? I'm guessing it's Calliope. Contestant number one, cantaloupe. Calliope? 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 It's not Calliope? Calliope? One, cantaloupe. Calliope? Calliope? Calliope. Calliope? Calliope? Ah, okay. Calliope. I don't think that's very French, though. Oh my god. Mel Palmini. Mel Palmini. Okay, they didn't include this one. That does look like Mel Palmini. Mel Palmen. Mel Palmini. Mel Palmini. Okay, fair. Don't Mel Palmini. Like All right, don't got do it. My street like that. It's Mel Palmini. It's not Mel Palmini. Yes, don't let nobody tell you anything different Wait, like what? that. Mel Palmini. Mel Palmini. Don't do me like that. Don't do my street like that. It's melpamine. It's not melpamine. She's saying it's melpamine, but they're also saying the last one was correct. Now I'm just confused. Melpamine. Yes, don't let nobody tell you anything different. Terps. Terpsichor. Says shore. Terpsichor. Terpsichor. Terp. Terpsichor. Sicily. Terp. Terpsichor. Terpsichor. No. 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 It looks there's chore. There's a. Terpsichore, uh, yeah. You treep? No. You terp? You terpy? You terp. I'm thinking you terp. You terpy. Eater, eater. You derp. You derp. You terp. You terp. Got it. Is that it? Oh my gosh. Now, I used. Pardon? Chupitula? Chupitula. The work on this street. Mm -hmm. I used to run a store on this street. Chupitulus. Chupitulus. Chupitula. Chupitula. To chow. Chupitulus. Chupitulus. Yep. Chupitula. Chupitulus. I was close. I was close. Right off the river, down the street from the zoo. Ah. Uh, Carondel? Carondelet? 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 Carondelet. Carondelet? Carondelet. Carondelet. Is, is Carondelet? Is it Carondelet? No. Really? Carondelet. Interesting. Quit trying to mess with us. I'm going to go with my gut on this one. That looks like birth. <laughs> when I saw this, the first thing I thought was birth. I will birth you. Birthy? Berthe. I've never seen that street. Bertha? Buth. Buth. Buth? No. That's wrong. <laughs> it's digging it up. You so fat, do. Dufasat? Dufasat. Dufasat. <laughs> Dufasat. Uh, Dufasat. Dufasat? I feel like that's it. Dufasat. Dufasat? Turn on that faucet. Do you have a faucet? Turn. Yeah, this is not French. Turn on that faucet. Uh, so that's not Milan, is it? That word is the word Milan. Milan. Milan? Milan. 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 No. 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 That, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I knew a Milan back from school days, yeah. Everybody knows a Milan. Everybody knows a Milan. So I think this is a trick. It can't be. That is the word Socrates. That is straight up, there, there is no other word that that could be based on other than Socrates. So of course it's going to be Socrates or something like that. Socrates. Socrates. 
Socrates. Socrates. Socrates. Oh, no. Philosopher's name is Socrates, but this is probably Socrates. Socrates! I hate this. I hate this. I don't know what they was thinking. Y'all trying to fool me. Okay, come on. That's Burgundy. The average person would look at that and call it by the color name, right? Ah. Oh. No, no, you're not going to tell me that that's not pronounced Burgundy. What do you mean? What on earth do you mean that is not pronounced Burgundy? Beautiful color. Burgundy. 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 See, I want to say Burgundy. That's too obvious. Bur Burgundy. Bur yeah, now you're just, now, now you're just changing things. Now you're just changing things for fun. Gundy. Yes, thank you. And this is actually really famous. Is it Chartres? Street, and I just butcher it every time. Chartres? Chartres. Chartres. Chartres? Chartres. Charles. Charté. Shoot. Charts. Charters. Charters. <laughs> no, 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 because if it were charters, the R would be after the E, like in the word charter school or charter. I got there. I just got to put myself in the New Orleans mentality. Uh, in, in Alabama, that is Decatur, but this is probably Decatur. De Decatur. The capital. Why is it going to be some Decatur? Decatur. 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 Dodecahedron. Oh, there's a Decatur, Alabama, and in New Orleans, the street is called Decatur. <laughs> oh, so it is Decatur. Horrible. New Orleans. Horrible. Bless and learn here. Don't get lost in New Orleans because you ain't going to find your way home. I should have got 100, like, but I know I did better than everybody. Do, do they have one? Do they have one for, for Philly? Um, let's see. Ah, uh, no, see, this is just sad. Here we go. Hard to pronounce Philadelphia places because I'm confused. I, I knew there had to be one for this. All right, here we go. Here we go. Now I'm excited. Now, uh, how about this pumpkin bear? Come on. How do you pronounce that word? How, how do you pronounce that? How do you pronounce that word? It's skookle, by the way. Shulkill. Or school kill, depending on if you're old. Shulkill. 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 Wow, for a news network, they have really bad audio. Shulkill. Shulkill. Skookle. Skookle. Oh! Didn't see that one. Where is Care 11? Oh yeah, all right, there there we go. Didn't see that one. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? B-A-L-A-C-Y-N-Y, or W-Y-D. It's Bala Kinwood. Bala Sinwood. Bala Sinwood. Bala Sinwood. Bala Sinwood? Bala Sinwood. Bala Sinwood. Welcome to Bala Sinwood. Bala Kinwood. Bala Kinwood. Mm -hmm. That actually sounds a lot Where better. Where is Carol? Kinwood. Kinwood. It's going to be everything we don't think. Yeah. St. Paul, Minnesota. Oh, oh, here's a good one. Don't think. Yeah. <laughs> Who named Philadelphia? Uh, William Penn, I believe. What do you guys think? I think it's gonna be Maniunk. 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 I like Maniunk. 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 You're actually correct. Yeah. It is Maniunk. So yeah. yes. Good yeah. job. <laughs> All right. We got one. Uh, Balakinwood is Welsh. Skookil is uh, Native American. I think it's Lenape. I want to say these are Lenape words. Uh, Maniunk is also, I believe, Lenape, as is this one. What do you think this one is, kids? We call it Conchi. That won't help. Oh my god, these are hard. Conchakakong. <laughs> oh my goodness, what is this? Conchahawken. 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 
Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you, well, you That's right? <laughs> yeah, Bailey, bring it! <laughs> ooh, ooh, cool. All right, perfect. <laughs> it's Contra Hawken. Schuylkill, Valley Kinwood, Maniunk, Olney, Contra Hawken. Wait, Olney? Where was that? Olney wasn't even in there. Did they forget to put it in? But yeah, anyway, so that's uh that's Philly. <laughs> we go if we go to the maps, we go down into the city, it's it gets real fun. Um Here we go. What about this one? This one right here. What do we think? It's Passyunk. I actually don't even know this one. I do not know what that one is. That is completely foreign to me. This is West Philly, across the river. But yeah, I mean, like... We got a bunch of these. Hartrumpt? I don't even know if that's right. But yeah. What do you guys think about this one right here? It's Juniata. Oh, you mean, uh, Glenfer Perwingle, uh, Glenfer Perwingle... Clanfer Pochwingle Gogri Quirndrob Quilintan Quilant Clentisilio Gogogogach. That one, which is actually pronounced. Uh, and today we had a big contrast in temperature across the UK, just 12 degrees over coastal parts of eastern England with cloudy skies, but in the sunshine in northwest Wales at RAF Mona, just up the road from Clanbyr Pochwingle Gogere Quindrob Clentisilio Gogogogach. The temperature got to 21 Celsius. Yep. He just, he just, he just hits it. Uh, it means, the word actually means, uh, where is it? Um, it's, uh, St. Mary's Church in the hollow of the White Hazel near to the rapid whirlpool of Clantacilio of the Red Cave, which means that it's entirely possible that there is also a St. Mary's Church in the hollow of the White Hazel near to the rapid whirlpool of Clan Tassilio of not the Red Cave. Or, more likely, that there is a St. Mary's Church in the hollow of the White Hazel near to the rapid whirlpool, but it is not near to the rapid whirlpool of Clan Tassilio of the Red Cave, but rather a different rapid whirlpool. Very important. He turned jazz into a Honey, we got to jazz it. He turned jazz into a I'm not going to throw out this axe, so we better jazz it. He's a bit like Santa Claus. Okay, I'd like First to hear all, he how he says he's going to pass over New Orleans. That's a bit magical. Sure. Yes, Santa Claus, and not, I don't know, the angel of death he was referencing in the story, guys. Just imagine him flying through the skies with his big axe, riding a crocodile <laughs> or an alligator, or whatever they got. Or a demon. Traveling on demon's wings. Just looking By the way, this is at 1.25 speed. They sound like they're talking normally now. <laughs> it's like a good enough He's like the Grinch trying to listen to the Whoville people sing. Exactly right. I still don't understand how he's Santa Claus. Santa Claus never bashed anyone's head. Do in. Michigan ones? I lived in Ypsilanti. Although Michigan, I'm going to say it's, uh, it's Ypsilanti or Ypsilanti. With a big sack of toys. That's true. But he does give him calls. I would guess that's Rancho Cucamonga. Oh. What? This letter would later spark the creation of a jazz song entitled Don't Scare Me Papa, also known as the Mysterious Axeman's Jazz. This is going so out of hand so quickly. I, I, I have to wonder if this was like somebody's plan to, to stop the Axeman was to just make him such a ridiculous figure. Tuesday night mentioned in the letter was March 19th, 1919. It is said that the city was truly alive that night, as people blasted jazz music in their homes, and those who did not have a record player poured into local jazz clubs to stay clear of the Axeman's wrath. It's yeah, all of this sounds like outside, like, like something else entirely. Worth mentioning that- Like they were trying to catch the guy somehow. Nobody was killed on March 19th, 1919. So, he kept his word. Apparently everyone was jazzing it. You know what? He was probably just going to be out of town. 
<laughs> Either, wouldn't this be funny? I've got a business trip that weekend. Let's see how many smokers I can make dance. Yeah. <laughs> On August 10th, 1919, Steve Boca was badly injured in his home after he awoke to a man next to his bed with an ax. Boca managed to survive the attack, reportedly staggering to a friend's home, who then called the police. Boca did not regain his memory, likely due to the blows to the head. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, that usually does it. Yep. Yeah. I once fell into a pile of bricks when I was a kid. What? And I don't remember much of it after that. What? Yeah, I was climbing because we were playing hide and seek. I was trying to hide and I thought I had the best hiding spot. Turns out I was wrong. The branch broke and I just- This explains fell. a lot. You fell into And after that, I could see ghosts. I don't think it gave you the vision. It gave me my eyes. I think it put a hole in your brain. <laughs> Later that month, or in early September, on 2128 2nd Street, 19-year-old Sarah Lawman was reportedly attacked by someone who entered through an open window. When she regained consciousness, she could not recall details of the attack. So this is the site of the second to last attack. And apparently the house is gone. No. Oh. Yeah. About two months Seems late. Seems like the kind of thing you could have figured out before you got there. Here on October 27, 1919, at the corner of South Scott and Uloa Street, the suspected Axeman attacked Esther and Mike Pepitone. Esther reportedly awoke around 1 a.m. to her- Yeah, this is on 1.25 times speed. Her husband screaming and ran to the bedroom. Her husband's head was struck 18 times and died two hours later. Esther saw two figures in the bedroom, but could not identify them as they fled the scene. By the way, two figures. Razor boy. Oh my god, no. He's back. No, we're not calling He's back from boarding school. <laughs> A bolt with a heavy nut, something used to secure a circus tent, was one of the apparent weapons. There was a circus on the nearby Tulane Avenue that weekend. Was this the last one? Uh, yes. If this guy survived for two hours after getting struck 18 times, the axe man probably wasn't used to that kind of resilience. He probably hit him once and the guy was like, oh boy, what a bump. And he was or like, uh, all right, I guess I'll hit you again. He was like, oh my goodness, I didn't feel much better. <laughs> I'm like, three, four, five. <laughs> this takes us to the supposed end of the axe man's killing spree. And with that, let's get into the theories. The first theory. Okay, well, was there... Was there a circus in town the whole time? Because that would explain it. Is that perhaps not all of the killings were the work of the Axeman? Some speculate that the Axeman's presumed final killing of Mike Pepitone was actually a mafia killing, due to Mike Pepitone's father killing a man in the past. Another Axeman attack that is scrutinized is the second attack on Louis Bessemer and Anna Lowe. If you'll recall, Louis Bessemer was severely injured, and his partner Anna Lowe was killed in that same attack. However, Bessemer was charged with the murder of Anna in bizarre fashion. Police found that Bessemer had written letters back and forth in Yiddish and Russia. They eventually came to the conclusion that Bessemer was part of a German spy ring or spy master for the Kaiser, and the attack had nothing to do with the Axeman. A spy's not gonna bash someone's head in with an axe. And then bash his- Eventually, Tsar fashion, police found that Bessemer had written letters back and forth in Yiddish and Russian. They eventually came to the conclusion- Would you write Yiddish in Hebrew script? I think Yiddish would be Latin script, wouldn't it? ...that Bessemer was part of a German spy ring or spy master for the Kaiser, and the attack had nothing to do with the Axeman. A spy's not gonna bash someone's head in with an axe. And then bash his own head in. Right. He's gonna, he's gonna lower a string from the ceiling and put a drop of poison on it and let that poison fall into a sleeping person. Yeah, that seems a little silly. His mouth, right in there. Well, if they're, they're sleeping, then why don't you just drop it into their mouth like a little droplet thing? Why I, don't, I don't know. That's what spies do. That's I just what they do. The first time I've heard that, I think you just Everybody does You're on a plane? Well, that. congratulations. It, it happens in a James Bond film. <laughs> Which one? Um, the racist one, where he's <laughs> okay. in Japan. Before dying, Anna Lowe allegedly blamed her partner, Louis Bessemer, and said that he was a Nazi spy. They also theorized that this case was a domestic dispute that ended with Louis attacking Anna. Wait. Hang on. Hang on. Uh Okay, so she told them that it was a mulatto man. Uh, media attention soon turned to Bessemer himself, as a series of letters written in German, Russian, and Yiddish were discovered in a trunk of the man's home. Police suspected that Bessemer was a German spy, and government officials began a full investigation of his potential espionage. Weeks later, after going in and out of consciousness, Harriet Lowe told police that she thought Bessemer was in fact a spy. Well, who's... Okay, so this is saying Harriet Lowe. They've named her as Anna Lowe. Weird. Um, okay. 
Media attention soon turned to Bessemer himself as a series of letters written in German, Russian, and Yiddish were discovered in a trunk at the man's home. Police suspected that Bessemer was a German spy, and government officials began a full investigation of his potential espionage. Weeks later, after going in and out of consciousness, Harriet Lowe told the police she thought Bessemer was in fact a German spy, which led to his immediate arrest. Um, what was the relationship between the two? Uh... Okay. A few days later, Bessemer was released, and two lead investigators of the case were demoted due to unacceptable police work. Okay. Once again arrested in August 1918, uh, after Harriet Lowe, who lay dying in Charity Hospital after a failed surgery, stated that it was he who attacked her more than a month previously with his hatchet. I mean, to me, what this sounds like is the police had absolutely nothing to go on and needed a man, so they tried to pin it on him. Um, okay, so she was his, it appears she was his his wife or partner of some kind. Um, attacked while lying in bed with her. Okay, she continually made scandalous and often false statements relating to both the attacks and the character of Louis Spetsimer. Uh, so here's the, the other thing, is if she had a head injury... There's all sorts of other stuff that's possible. Also, most importantly, he can't possibly have been a Nazi spy because the Nazis weren't really in control of anything. Nonetheless, if they were even relevant yet. Yeah, no, the Nazis didn't exist yet, so it wasn't a Nazi spy. Louis Bessemer was acquitted. There were definitely things that suggested this was the work of the Axemen, mainly the fact that it happened at home at night while they were sleeping with an axe. That would take such an enormous amount of fortitude to be able to, you know, really smash someone. And then, and then also, yeah. like, I have a hard time pulling off a Band-Aid. Though, you are a wimp, and if anyone would have mental fortitude to do something that would be painful, it would be a spy, wouldn't they? I just think okay, it's very I, I really think these guys have, like, a warped perception of what spies are, especially that long ago. You're calling me a wimp. Yeah. Because you send me screenshots of names you want me to pronounce? Okay. You're a, a footstep and you go into, Ooh, they better hide under the bed. In vain with this theory, it's also speculated on the internet that some of the killings of the Axeman could have been the work of a copycat. The second theory is that given the context of his bizarre letter, some believe the Axeman to be a supernatural figure that could slip through tiny entranceways and become the large man that witnesses describe the killer to be. Probably no, not. No, 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 no. Just a theory. That it, well, Sorry. it's dumb. <laughs> He shrunk down like a little mouse? Is that what you're saying? I, He's like Ant-Man? Ant He's like, pff, pff, pff. <laughs> now I'm big, time to die. At what point? <laughs> the last theory is actually a legitimate suspect, a man named Joseph Mumphrey. To start on Mumphrey, let's return to the Axeman's last crime, the attack on Esther and Mike Pepitone. If you recall, Esther survived the attack and her husband did not. Esther later moved to Los Angeles and remarried to a man named Angelo Albano. However, on the second anniversary of her former husband Mike's death by the Axeman, her current husband, Angelo, disappeared and was never found again. Esther recalled that before their marriage, Angelo had ended business relations with a man who went by many names, including Joseph Mumphrey. On December 5th, 1921, Mumphrey visited Esther's home at 554 East 36th Street in Los Angeles. He demanded $500 and Esther's jewelry, threatening that he would, quote, kill her the same way he had killed her husband, end quote. But like a badass, Esther then killed him with a revolver. Whoa! Good for Whoa. her. We've had two badass ladies in the story. The Damn. girl who got whacked over the head, still gave birth and survived, and then this girl who got threatened and was like, oh, fuck that. Well, then. you know what I'll do is I'll shoot you. <laughs> this is the spot where Esther shot Joseph Mumphrey to death. Kind of crazy to think that this may be the location where the Axeman actually was killed. Good for you, Esther. Shoot him in the face. Yeah, I mean, what more can you do? I don't know. I mean, tracking that victim all the way over there i don't understand why this guy is it could just be that they haven't actually explained it very well but um those are all the victims suspects um okay so this is this is where the joseph mumphrey thing seems to come from Two of the alleged early victims of the Axeman, an Italian couple named uh, Schiambra, were shot by an intruder in their lower Ninth Ward home in the early mornings of May 6, 1912. 
Uh, the male Scambra survived while his wife did not. In newspaper accounts, the prime suspect is referred to by the name of Mumphrey more than once. While radically different from the Axeman's usual modus operandi, if Joseph Mumphrey was indeed the Axeman, the Scambras may well have been early victims of the future serial killer. Uh, all right. Wilson's theory has been widely repeated in other true crime books and websites. However, crime writer Michael Newton searched New Orleans and Los Angeles public police and court records as well as newspaper archives failed to find any evidence of a man with the name Joseph Monfrey. Uh, having been assaulted or killed in Los Angeles could be again because he goes by many names. Um, Newton was also not able to find any information that Mrs. Pepitone identified in some sources as Esther Albano uh, and in others simply as a woman who claimed to be Pepitone's widow was arrested, tried, or convicted for such a crime or had indeed been in California. That's the bigger one because uh, if he was shot to death while threatening her okay here we go what do we have uh leon manfrey in defense of her home after he told her that he had killed her husband threatened her with death uh okay wait so does this i'm sorry wait a second Newton was not able to find any information that Mrs. Pepitone was arrested, tried, or convicted for such a crime, or had indeed been in California. And yet, right here in the Los Angeles Times, it seems to be saying just that. This is why you this is why you always got to check your sources if you're using Wikipedia. Um, let's see. Uh half presumably fired half dozen lead pellets. Uh They are anxious to help prove your theory. They are jealous and incensed at the prosecution's theory that an unidentified man presumably fired the half dozen lead pellets into the victim. The reason is her assertion that she killed him in self-defense. Okay. This is very confusing. So the prosecution asserted that an unidentified man presumably killed him? This is very confusing to read. Uh... Yes, Albano has a big house. Wait, what is this? Here were some circumstances, part of which are known to Mrs. Albano, and the rest can be substantiated by Mrs. Griffith. Her neighbor, Manfrey, was a was Mr. Albano's business partner. They are said to have had disagreements over finances, and Mr. Albano took over Manfrey's interests. According to Mrs. Griffith, uh, and these are entirely new facts just brought to light, she asked Manfrey a week early after Mr. Albano's disappearance if she knew what had become of him. She quotes him as saying, Yes, Albano has a big house and plenty of money. He is being held for some of that money. His wife, his wife will be asked for it after things quiet down. Uh, and furthermore, according to Mrs. Griffith and several other neighbors, two suspicious-looking men were seen lurking around the Albano premises for several nights prior to his disappearance. Manfrey walks in. There was a knock at the door before she could answer the summons. The door opened and Mr. Manfrey walked in. Manfrey closed the door, she says. She faced him across the dining room table. Ten feet away, he spoke in Italian, making known his errand without parrying words. Uh, in substance, she says he demanded $500 and all of her jewelry, giving as an alternative the remark, if you refuse, I shall kill you just as I killed your husband. All right. Yeah, this is, this is interesting, but it's weird that the Wikipedia article says that he could find no, uh, this is so weird. Newton was also not able to find any information that Albano was arrested, tried, or convicted in such a crime, or indeed him in California. This would suggest that she very much was in California. How, how is this paragraph on the same Wikipedia page next to an image proving it's wrong? 
Uh, okay. This is weird. Um, yeah, this is a super weird little thing right here. Uh, anyway. He actually indeed killed two of her husbands. Yeah. Whether or not he's the axe man, shoot him in the face. Yeah, face full of bullets. He had it coming. Yeah, give him a bullet sandwich. Now, what does this have to do with the axe man? Given the fact that Esther was present for the axe man slaying of her husband, Mike Pepitone, when Esther was arrested for shooting Joseph Mumphrey, she claimed that Mumphrey was the axe man and had seen him run from her bedroom the night her husband was slain. The LAPD noted that there was evidence linking Mumphrey to the death of Mike Pepitone, and Esther was acquitted for Mumphrey's death. Here are some other things that seem to suggest Joseph Mumphrey was the axe man. Upon investigation, the police found that Mumphrey led a blackmailing gang in New Orleans that preyed on Italians, and almost all of the axe man's victims were Italians. These guys are racist? Most of them were Italian grocers. Oh, fuck this guy. <laughs> this is what made you turn? If there's already the basis that he's gonna be killing, I do not approve of that, but if he's gonna do it, then at least do it randomly. I think just don't, don't kill people. Look, Ryan, what are we here for? <laughs> just, I thought we were here to get into the mind of a serial killer. I know, I'm just saying, what if they all just happened to be Italian grocers? Oh, that's rich. It all just <laughs> happened to be, yeah, that'll okay, hold so up in court. Mumphrey was in and out of prison for the past 10 years, and his time outside of prison coincided with attacks by huh? the Axeman. Huh? What the fuck? Hey. Uh, weird. Hey. Yeah, I'm 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 working on it. Um YouTube basically said uh we detected video belonging to somebody else, which is weird because I do this all the time and I'm absolutely not in violation of anything, but yeah, if you could tell the uh the chat that I'm working on fixing it. Yeah. Say that BuzzFeed decided that uh, I'm not allowed to react to their content. <laughs>
Um, yeah, I mean, the, I don't know how, like, it just says your stream is blocked. Your stream is no longer being blocked due to copyright issues. Okay, so they can see me again. All right, cool. All right, thank you for for being an intermediary here. Um, all right, yeah. So I am I back now? Can they see me again? You can, can you can see me, you can hear me, it's all good. Yep. Awesome. Good. All right, thank you. I'm going to hang up and get back to doing the the, the stream. All right. See you. Will do. See ya. See ya. Um, okay. It's not catching up. Ah, there we go. All right. I am visible again. Hey guys. I uh, thank you, YouTube, for costing me a fifth of the viewers that I had this stream. That was really cool. Uh, for those who don't know, what happened is that because BuzzFeed are silly little cuck boys, uh, they apparently have have made it a big problem for anybody to react to their content because this is the only time in two years of doing reaction content I... Uh, well, I guess it, at least in like six months of doing reaction content on YouTube that I've ever had that happen. Not once before has that happened. So BuzzFeed, your mom's a hoe, fuck you. Uh, Shane and Ryan suck my ass and everybody else at BuzzFeed. No wonder y'all went bankrupt. Like just utterly, utterly absurd that they are doing that. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess I can't. Uh, you know, continue with this video. It's basically over anyway. Um, you know, and of course, because we don't sit around being all millennial and lame and doing no research whatsoever, our video on the Axeman will never get as many views as this one. So, uh, you know, great job, BuzzFeed. Not only have you told stories that make no sense and gotten half the facts wrong, but you also suck as people and as business people. So, yeah, uh, eat my ass. Fuck you. Anyway, on to, uh, would you guys prefer Lazy Masquerade, Disturbing Things I Found on the Internet, Volume 8, or Lilith and the Sacred Serpent from Robert Sepper? That's, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let chat decide really quick. All right, why is this like this? Like, this thing always ends up changing position on me for some reason. But here we go. It's all good. It's all good in the hood. Who's even around from Buttfeed to claim copyright anymore? I don't know. Whoever's still making money from their content, I guess. Um, let me look through. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing that I'm going to have to deal with, uh, with YouTube. Um demonetizing this video after this but we'll see all right well fine shane and ryan don't have to suck my ass but everybody else at buzzfeed does um let's see i i should have i should have done a poll because i can't for the life of me tell which of these it is uh looks like i'm seeing more lazy masquerade than Robert Sepper. So, I mean, Sepper is just going to be us kind of laughing. But here, let's, uh, what we'll do is we'll grab this most watched moment from Sepper's video, see how bad it is, 
And then from there, we'll go over to uh, Lazy Masquerade. Kellen, where did you send it to me? Was it on uh, on Discord? Not seeing it. Or where where would it have been? The hell is this? Um, it would be message requests. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm not seeing it, Kellen. Oh, Instagram. Okay, let me snag it. Oh, it's you. Why is one of my group chats on Instagram doing a video call right now? General. Uh, wait, which, uh, which, um, which Instagram account? So I'm, I'm not seeing it. Was it the, uh, first of all dark mode hell yes um message yeah i don't i don't see it uh if it was sent to the other one to the lore lodge one i might be able to go snag it uh that is the wrong account come on Yeah, I'm not seeing it on either of my Instagrams. Oh, there we go. Now it's showing up. There we go. For some reason, it was it was not. Oh, I got a message that says hi. Is that? Did, had you sent it a long time ago? Is that what happened? Oh, okay, got it, got it. Pulling it up. Pulling it up. So. Uh... This one. Kind of hard to see for you guys. Wow, that's super weird. Nope. Nope. So, uh... This is a thing. Nope. It's hard to tell if it, like, starts slowing down or anything. This is a thing. It doesn't seem to change... ...speed, either. Nope. So, uh... Yeah, it doesn't change speed. It should be slowing down if somebody just run outside and thrown it, you know? Nope. Yeah, that's very strange. Nope. Huh. Nope. I'll have to, uh... I'll have to dig into that one a little bit more. So, uh... Oh, boy, this is... Wow. Okay. That's a. Uh, it's a lot. So, uh... I love you. Love language is bite. Boy, very sweet.
Sweet equals yum. Bite is sweet. Boy so sweet. Bite boy. Bite equal love. According to the judgment of the oratrice mechanique d'analyse cardinale, we now turn to the oratrice mechanique d'analyse cardinale. The judgment of... You know, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. If you press that button, you will receive one million... Uh, yeah, I'll be honest, looking at the account, I would not be surprised if that was some sort of hoax. What? What? Are you the miracle... ...to gain traction for the page. Is there anything else? Like, oh, that is a... That was a, a giant penis, is what that was. So that's not ideal. But, uh, yeah, so let's see. Uh, it's beacons, but just to be safe, I'm moving it over to the other screen. Uh, yep, yep, there we go. OnlyFans. So, I mean... I just wouldn't at all be shocked. But it... It doesn't slow down, which I will say is certainly interesting. Maybe I'll have Aiden do some analysis on it and see uh, see if he can tell if that changes at all. Um, super random, but I've always wondered, what do Freemasons think of the uh, Latter-day Saints Church? As a member of that faith, I've never had a chance to ask a Freemason. Uh, yeah, so an ex-girlfriend of mine had her dad and her... Uh, I want to say it was her, either her grandfather or her step grandfather, can't recall which, but uh, they were they were Mormons. Um, and the thing about Mormonism is that it did adopt a lot of Freemason ritual and symbolism and structure. So we obviously allow we allow Mormons. Um, I would say Freemasonry probably looks upon Mormons more favorably than it does upon Catholics. Uh, but we really, we don't have anything against Catholics. It's more that we dislike the Pope. Um, and it isn't even like a, like a Catholics aren't allowed to be Freemasons thing on our side. It's more that we didn't really have a distinction about it. And the Catholics decided that they needed beef with us. So, yeah, we don't really have a problem with uh, Mormons, though. Um, in fact, they, they probably would find Freemasonry very easy to fit into. But I want to see what he says here. After murdering his father and older brother, he had a queen, two deputy queens, six royal consorts, 72 madams, and 3,000 palace maidens. Who but even that about? wasn't enough to satisfy him sexually. Palace or queen took the throne. Around the year 600 AD, the last Sioux emperor took the throne okay. after murdering his father and older brother. He had a queen, two deputy queens, six royal consorts, 72 madams, and 3,000 palace maidens. Dude, talk faster. But even that wasn't enough to satisfy him sexually. He had a particular thing for teenage virgins <laughs> and reportedly used a virgin wheelchair to capture them. According to a palace historian, I want to know what a virgin wheelchair is. Historian, after the girl was seated, quote, clamps would automatically spring up to hold her arms and spread her legs apart, while the mechanized cushion would place her body in the right position to receive the royal favor. Imperial women also indulged themselves. Empress Wu Zhe Tian was a 7th century ruler who had her own harem of men. But I won't go into details here because the stories are so shocking even by today's standards, that most people will not believe them anyway. It was thought that organizing the emperor's Man sex really life goes out of his way to find a way to put a swastika into stuff. I don't understand what this has to do with Lilith. Emina, it seems likely that the king is practicing ancient internal alchemy, as some emperors believed that they could gain immortality from having sex with as many women as possible, but never ejaculating. Around the year 600 AD, Hey, yo. 
Yeah, see, uh, this is why you can't just come into Tartaria videos midway, is because you hear people say things like, he thought he could achieve immortality by having sex with lots of women and never ejaculating. That is... Wow. Also, I love how he says Lilith is sometimes referred to as Adam's first wife in a, like, 6th or 7th century Jewish satire piece, uh, who also became known as a succubus demon. I... Uh, actually was a succubus demon before she was allegedly Adam's first wife, because Lilith seems to be a term coming out of Babylon. Uh, some medieval texts identify Lilith as the serpent who tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, yeah. Sure. I, I guess. The Hebrew Bible mentions Lilith once, Isaiah 34, 14. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's the thing. Here's what the Bible actually says. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl shall also rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Do you notice that there's a word missing? Do you notice there's a word missing? It's Lilith. Because the word Lilith is not there. Um, The word... Lilith is actually being translated as Screech Owl in the, uh, in the KJV, it is, um, or not the KJV, which one is it actually? I can't remember. Um, it's the, uh, the Lilithus, I believe. Um, Screech Owl, here, let's, uh, yeah, all right. Um, indeed, Lilith will settle there and find herself a place of rest. Here it says Night Demon. It seems a lot more likely that what they're talking about is in fact Screech Owls, or Owls, or just Nocturnal Predators. Um, very unlikely that they're using Lilith to mean any sort of demon. It is possible they were going with the Babylonian one, but again, hard to say. But here we go. We'll, we'll wrap up the last 20 minutes with uh with some lazy let's do let's do these two because this one's going to be so long that we won't get to the other two this topic includes images that may disturb some viewers if you'd like to skip to, to the next entry you can do so using the timestamps on the progress bar ancient game released in 2004 to both critical and commercial success Half-Life 2 is still considered one of the most influential and groundbreaking games of all- Are people who talk slow worse than Parcast? Uh... <laughs> worse than? No. As bad as? Yes. All time. Developed and published by the legendary Valve Corporation, this second installment in the Half-Life series was originally intended to have a much darker, grittier, and overall more somber tone. Traces of that can still be found in the end product, especially in areas like Ravenholm, but perhaps one of the creepiest I probably should play Half-Life. I've never done it. Things you can encounter in the game is this. Oh. That's frightening. Corpse01.mdl. If you're familiar with Source Engine games, you'll most certainly have met this fellow at some point. With regards to Half-Life 2, you'll find many of these models strewn unceremoniously throughout the campaign. They're generally used as props for some eerie environmental storytelling. The fallen humans that you pass on your journey, who've met with a variety of terrible fates, positioned in ways that let the player fill in the blanks with their imagination. But far more disturbing than any NPC's hypothetical backstory is the disturbing reality of this model itself. Despite Half-Life 2 having cutting-edge graphics for the time it was released, something about this that, model's that face really like seemed to be a bit too particularly realistic. And while browsing through the r slash creepy gaming oh. subreddit, I came across this spun problem which hinted that the texture may have an extremely dark origin, one that most people didn't know about. That's dark. And after doing a little digging, I found out that was true. Corpso-1's facial texture have been taken from a real-life photo. Yeah, because I was gonna say, that that cannot possibly just be from the same texture pack as the game. Look how different the noise level is. ...upshot of a man's body, one whose face had been completely burnt off. That's rough. For obvious reasons, I can't show that photo here on YouTube. It's pretty much identical to the in-game model's facial texture, the only difference being that in the real photo, the man still has one of his eyes mostly intact. For the in-game texture, an artist simply duplicated the man's empty eye socket. Perhaps they thought keeping a natural lifeless eye in the game was a step too far. Yeah. 
From what I can find online, the photo was taken from a medical textbook used to teach students about burns. The images used in such textbooks are sourced from all over the place. This has led many people to speculate about who this man was in life and how he came to meet such a terrible fate. And strangely, despite the man's face being completely burned off, his neck, chest, and even hair remain undamaged. It's hard to think up an explanation for how this man, whoever he was, could have sustained such a wound accidentally. Ah! Uh... Yeah! I mean, ha- Be very hard to do that. It almost feels like the burning has to have been done to him intentionally. Yeah. I've seen many people repeating the same explanation online. That he was the victim of a mafia killing, and that they used a blowtorch to melt his face off and make an example of him. That would explain why his hair is intact. It but would. even though that story keeps getting repeated as if it were fact, there's absolutely no evidence that this man met with foul play, other than the strange condition of his body. Could also be a backdraft. Uh, I mean, it's, it, anything that would tar like target flames to a specific location could do that. Personally, I think there's a more innocent text. Wait, why did I just see two separate videos from two different channels about leaving YouTube? Yes. Explanation. Yeah, innocent is the right word to use. Many people donate their remains to science, and many of those are used to teach med students. I think it's far more likely that a medical practitioner took one of those cadavers and torched the facial area specifically as a teaching example. That's also possible. At least, I hope that's the case. Since the photo's online fingerprint can only be traced back to 2011, that means that some employee at Valve must have scanned a copy of a textbook and imported the texture into the game, possibly without asking permission from the book's publisher, and definitely without asking permission from the deceased or his relatives. Probably. Half Life 2 had a notoriously rushed development cycle, so this may have been done as a time saving measure. But even well, no, yeah, the one I saw on the side of the screen was the game theorists, but the one I'm talking about was, uh. Tom Scott. This isn't the standard YouTuber burnout apology video, and it's not, oh, woe is me, I'm leaving forever. I'm yeah, going this. somewhere with this. Literally. I've been throwing stuff at the internet since 1999, and for many, many years, that stuff went almost nowhere. I had occasional bit... Dude actually really does not look that old. ...of success, but I could never make any of them last long term. I remember thinking so many times during all those years, will any of this stuff I'm making ever work? Well, this did. I didn't know that back when I was filming the first videos for the series that was then called... Uh... Yeah, I mean, it sounds like he's just saying, saying he's retiring. Which, I don't blame him. I mean, the kind of views he gets, he's probably made all the money he could possibly need to make. And now he can go and, you know, post TV shows and stuff. So it's happened ticked, and the image was a royalty-free stock photo. Valve still didn't tell any of their player base about the texture's origin, leaving them to interact with a real body in Half-Life 2. Roleplay as him in Gary's mod and use him in fan projects. Most of them ignorant about the texture's less than wholesome backstory. That being said, I suppose it's possible that nobody at Valve even realized the disturbing origin of the texture themselves. That's to say, it may have come in a third-party asset library without its origin being explicitly That's noted. That's true. Off the top of my head, I can't think of many games that feature real photos of dead people. Hong Kong 97, Batman the Enemy Within, but many others have used morbid references for their models. For instance, several of Bioshock's splicer enemies were based on World War I soldiers who underwent pioneering facial surgeries. Mortal yeah. Kombat 11 developers looked at obliterated bodies to design their infamous fatalities, leaving one staff member needing therapy. Yeah. And as for Valve themselves, their development team on Left 4 Dead 2 would create a nightmare folder full of stomach-churning real images, but found this type of research to be so gratuitous and unnecessary that they didn't make use of any of them in-game, instead basing their zombie designs on things like housing insulation and potato skins. So yeah, it it's... you can certainly... You can certainly, uh... Run into some... Some stuff. Doing this job. Let alone doing that job. Seems Valve did learn their lesson in the end. And you can be sure that if Half-Life 3 ever does get announced, this texture will almost certainly not be making a reappearance. I also have no idea what is in Matt Pat's video that, like, I don't know why he's leaving, but... Unfortunately. This isn't the only texture in Half-Life 2 based on a real person with a sad backstory. Though not directly ripped from real-life photos, many of the human characters in-game are modeled on actual people. 
mostly actors, Valve employees and their families, all of whom are credited in-game. All of them, that is. Except for the facial reference for e It does have surprisingly good graphics for when it came out. Eli Barnes. While searching for inspiration for the character's face, Valve's graphic designer, Randy Linden, passed a homeless man holding a sign, saying he was looking for work. Since the man had a, quote, interesting appearance, Randy asked him to come back to the studio and have his face scanned into the game in return for a few bucks. The developers never even took note of the man's name, and he was never credited in any of the games oh, he appeared in. Well, that's just kind of shitty. Despite being immortalized in one of the most legendary games of all time, we still don't know who this man is. It makes you wonder whether he's even aware of how well known his face has become. Whoever he is, I hope he's still out there somewhere and doing okay. Oh, he's not retiring, he's just changing his upload schedule. Okay, gotcha. The r slash confessions. confessions. A subreddit where people use throwaway accounts to share their deepest and darkest secrets. Though more often than not, the posts either revolve around personal dramas or cheating spouses. But every so often, you'll stumble upon a truly dark revelation. Like this post, made by an anonymous user ten months ago. I know the person who possibly committed an unsolved double murder. So I'll start by saying this. I'm not entirely sure that this is true, so take it with a grain of salt. My neighbor of two years is a retired Delta Force officer. He's been through some shit in terms of war and its ramifications as far as PTS and paranoia goes. He can barely walk, and I work at a grocery store down the street. I do little jobs for him, bring him things from the store, and stuff like that. One day, after I come back from the store, he starts talking to me about where he's from. Basically, he was adopted by these two rich folks and moved into their house with another foster child whom he still calls his stepbrother. This town he lived in and grew up in was your basic industry town and didn't have much to offer. Therefore, like most small town people, he resorted to drinking and doing drugs. Well, he tells me that when he was a freshman or sophomore in high school, he was dating this one girl that he really liked. I'm not going to give her a name for reasons that'll soon become obvious, but she went to his school and was quite pretty and popular. In his words, she was the only girl I ever wanted to be with in high school, and I finally got my chance. One day, after they'd had an evening of fun, she left to go back home. But this was a lie that- He's, he's talking too slow. Uh, it was a lie that she told him so she'd go meet up with a guy at the park. He proceeds to tell me that me and my friends happen to be at the park, and we see her and this popular guy that I fucking hated. Apparently this park was somewhat of a makeout park. Then he says, I went up to the car, shot her in the head with a twenty two, and shot him in the chest so he wouldn't die, so that he could sit there and bleed out in pain and watch her die in front of him while I mock him. I kind of defensively sat there and went along with his bullshit, but then he brought out the evidence that he had grabbed from the car before him and his friends took off. Now, mind you, I thought this was absolute bullshit. He is very straightforward, and I believe he is an honest guy. He doesn't bullshit and realize nothing to lose considering he's dying of three different types of cancer, but I've never had anyone talk to me like this so intimately, especially something so real and crazy like murder. Fast forward to two weeks from that day with him, I watched one of those unsolved murder docs on YouTube curiously because I just wanted to see if anything he said had lined up. I have to say, though, everything down to a T lined up. It only got worse when this popular documentary, injured, viewed by hundreds of thousands of people, told me exactly the evidence taken from the car that I had just recently been shown by my neighbor. I didn't know what to do with this information. Every documentary I've watched on the double murder has been accurate, show it was my neighbor, and they all showed the evidence taken from the car that he has in his house over all these years. This happens many decades ago, and I truly don't know what to think. Why did he tell me that? Why would he ever make it up? Why would he have all these missing pieces? Um... My only thought at this point is that he's obsessed with this case and constructed all the evidence missing to make it look real, but even I know that's bullshit. He might very well be a psychopath, but he's far from a crazy fangirl. I think he genuinely told me the truth because at this point he has nothing to lose, and, I don't, and now I know of an unsolved murder. How do I deal with this? Going to the police won't do shit. He's always been good to me and paid me a lot of money and helped me out of bad situations using his military connections. Uh, I'm not going to believe I'm a bad person for only under this knowledge, but I genuinely want some feedback on what or how to fucking feel in these kinds of situations when you very well could be the person holding on to information that an innocent family has been searching for for years. Uh, well. Unsolved double homicide of two teenagers in car. This is probably the one. Uh, what happened here? Is this the one? The Westside Park murders. This is almost certainly the one. 
Um, all right. All right here, come on. Um, they were shot to death in Westside Park shortly before midnight on a Saturday night. Their bodies in the front seats of Ethan's Volkswagen Rabbit hatchback were discovered by a police officer who was so startled to see what his flashlight beam revealed inside the car that he momentarily turned off the light and stood in the darkness before radioing for help. When was this right here posted? Yeah, I don't know. This sounds entirely too much like a, a no-sleep story. I mean, neighbor of two years... Also, Delta Force officer strikes me as odd. Because to my understanding, and I could be wrong about this, but to my understanding, uh, Delta Force and Green Beret, Green Beret teams are maxed out at Sergeant being the highest rank. I mean, Kellen, maybe, maybe you know more about that than I do, but... I mean, 1985... When was formed? So 77 is Delta Force. I thought it was old enough, but... um, Yeah, I don't know. That seems... Wrong. You know, I'm trying to think. Somebody in 85... A teenager in 85, then in 2021, that would make them... Because this video came out six days ago. Um, they do? Okay, I thought that uh, Green Beret teams operated as entirely enlisted on the ground. Okay, what was it? I know the person who possibly committed an unsolved double murder. Who possibly committed... An unsolved double murder. Okay. Ah, it was deleted by the person who originally posted it. Um. Oh, it has to be the West Side Park murders. In which case, I mean, so he has a piece of evidence that is exactly described in documentary that already exists. Um, yeah, I mean, it didn't take long, but I'm almost positive that that is the West Side Park one. Um... And it's a deleted user. It was posted 11 months ago. I I don't know. I don't know that I buy this. Not him. Person who possibly committed an unsolved double murder. So have been searching for. What were the names of the victims? Where exactly had the incident taken place? And what was the evidence that the old man was keeping? Since the original poster, OP, was remaining tight-lipped, the good people of Reddit began conducting their own investigation to figure out the full story, and, if true, to bring this old man to justice. If the OP wasn't going to act on the confession, they were. After all, this certainly wouldn't have been the first time that someone had made a dark confession on Reddit that turned out to be true. Perhaps thinking that he shouldn't have opened up this can of worms, OP went on to delete the entire threat, oh, likely okay. in an effort to sweep his neighbor's past under the rug and stop this search effort. An effort which he certainly hadn't anticipated. Still, that didn't stop the most determined web sleuths from carrying on with their detective work. And soon, it became apparent which unsolved case Opie's neighbor had been involved in. User PReal420 made a separate post on RBI. Today I stumbled upon a post on r slash confessions. Oh, the OP had a throwaway, and the post was just deleted less than 15 minutes ago. OP asked if he should turn in his neighbor, who had confessed to a double murder. Upon researching the little bits of information he gave, I discovered he was talking about the Westside Park murders that happened in Muncie, Indiana in 1985. I guess I'm asking if that post- Damn, I'm good.
can be retrieved and traced back to its source. This seems very legit, but could be an elaborate troll. Either way, I believe it's something that should at least be looked into. The Westside Park Slings In September of 1985, Kimberly Dowell and Ethan Dixon were both slain in Muncie, Indiana, in the exact same fashion described by OP in his post. They were both found lifeless inside Ethan's Volkswagen Rabbit hatchback, with the engine still running. Several items had reportedly been taken from the scene. Witnesses reported seeing three individuals leaving the park at around the time of the incident, and this sketch of a possible suspect was released to the public. Despite a thorough investigation though, the case unfortunately went cold. Other Reddit users began to comment under P Reel's post, stating that they had contacted law enforcement. I mean, it would be easy enough to figure out who the man was. You just gotta figure out who from that town who was in high school that year went into the army. I mean, 85. Officer would imply military academy, but not necessarily. ...and Muncie, and brought the confession to their attention. Pirill himself even contacted the FBI. Unfortunately, they still haven't heard back from them. As such, the authenticity of OOP's post remains uncertain. Given the vagueness of the original post, it is completely possible that this was all just a tasteless hoax. But it's also completely possible that said vagueness was strategic, and that this was a genuine confession. After all, the real perp has to have been someone's neighbour. Why not OP's? Until we hear back from law enforcement, or some new developments arise, all we can do is wait for an update online, and speculate. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would be willing to believe that. Be very hard to track down who from that town ended up in Delta Force because of classified documents, but... I would be very, I mean, yeah, what's the population of Muncie, Indiana? Uh, all right, population of about 65,000, but in 1985, it actually was a bigger town. Weird. Uh, all right, so Muncie in night in 85 would have had probably about 73,000 residents. Um, let's see. Uh, Let's go to newspapers.com. We're going to go to Delta Force. Let's say Muncie, Indiana. Uh, we should probably hit sign in. Ah, there we go. That is, it always does this. Muncie. Muncie, Indiana. There we go. Okay, that is a movie thing. Star Press. What we got? Okay, so this was 1986 from the man who helped develop Delta Force. Okay, uh, all right, here's what we're going to look at. Um, is what west side right not that one um okay here let's hit history oh, of course it's not in there um Muncie, Indiana, double homicide. Um, 
Come on, man. There we go. West Side Park. Uh, all right. The hell? That was not, huh? Oh, wait, there we go. Um, retired and now reserve Muncie. That's uh, yeah. What? What the hell? Okay. Okay, so the word retired is right there on the page, man. Yeah, here we go. Okay. That's what I was looking for. Not him. Uh, okay, so it was the West Side Park murders. So we want to look at West Side Park. Muncie, Indiana, 1985. And the murders were... September 28th. going to sort by paper date, we'll say newest. And keep scrolling down. Yeah, again, like, how about we go with West Side Park, the specific search term? November, October, October, nope. There's a story about it. There's a story about it. Okay, so 15 and 16 year old. So what we want to do then is we want to look at army and we want to look at 1985 to Anything with joined the army. No. Okay. Find that the killer may have known the victims and that they might not have known they were in danger before they were shot. Um, a gun that came to police attention as a suspect weapon turned out not to be the murder weapon. Um, all right. So it should be easy enough looking at this to determine, I mean, basically if you can figure out what caliber weapon was used, okay. uh, Yeah, does it say? Uh, 
Um, by far the story that most shocked local residents. Uh, another teenager. Looks like... Hmm. Sheesh. Lot of kids responsible for killing people back then. What caliber bullet was used in the West Side Park murders in 1985? Come on, man. Ah, well, there we go. Easy. 38 caliber. kind of was a 38 revolver just his handgun see this is the uh, this is the stuff you got to look for with these things you always got to look for the little itty bitty details that is almost always how you tell they usually get the overarching story right it's the little itty bitty details like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that you'll... That's the kind of thing where I feel like you'd have to go to the town and sit and talk to people who were in high school in 1985 if you were ever going to figure that out. That said, I would definitely, definitely enjoy doing that. Maybe enjoy is not the right term, but... I would very much do that if I had the opportunity and, and uh, knew that it would be worth the investment. Um, yeah, 22 seemed odd. Uh, shooting someone in the head with a 22 to kill them is certainly a choice. Uh, also, the th there were some other things about that that did stick out to me, like the shooting him in the chest so that it wouldn't kill him immediately so we could watch the other person, like, so that he'd have to bleed out. Just stuff like that doesn't doesn't make sense to me. I mean, is that is that what it said that she that he uh let's see. Alright. Shot her in the head with a twenty two, which would essentially kill her instantly if it did in fact penetrate the skull. Close range it probably would. Um yeah, this just, a lot of this doesn't add up. It feels like it was written by someone without uh, detailed knowledge of the case. And my guess is this was probably just somebody trying to write a story to get attention, and they deleted it because they realized it was going to get them too much attention. So, yeah, just a little, little too weird. Um... Yeah, error 404, if you want to ask, go for it. Um, all right, but you know, that, that said, it is 9 p.m., and I have so much packing to do uh, for, for the flight tomorrow. So, uh, you know, thank you guys for hanging out. Um, I really appreciate it. I love when you guys are here for these shows. Sorry about the weird thing with YouTube in the middle of it. Uh, not sure what happened. Not sure what happened there. Uh, but I will be in contact with them, asking them what the fuck, and we will see how things go. So, uh, I, I'm probably not going to be streaming Thursday and Friday night. It's possible that I will stream one of those two nights, but, uh, but given the, uh, given the circumstances of me being in New Orleans, in a, in a different place, in a, in a home that is not mine, I. Uh, and that there's a lot of work to be done this week. 
probably not going to be streaming, but I will be back for it next week to the normal schedule, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, and yeah, that is, that is all. And I will see all of you on the next one. Bye guys.